Hello, my name's Dr. Phil Norrie. I'm a family physician in Sydney, Australia, and I'm also a wine and medical historian. This video is going to take you on a journey telling you the history of wine as a medicine from the time of the ancient Egyptians 5,000 years ago through to the Greek and Roman empires and on to today's modern scientific research. Until recently, the anti-alcohol lobby has had the high moral ground telling us that drinking alcohol is harmful. But that's if you abuse it. What we're talking about in this video is drinking wine in moderation. Because recent research has shown that drinking wine in moderation actually has benefit for one's health. Wine is man's oldest medicine. Wine is man's most documented medicine, and wine is man's best medicine, because if taken in moderation, it can reduce your death from all causes rate by up to 50%, not just from heart attack and stroke, but from all causes. I believe in it so much that I established my own vineyard, Pendarvis Estate, at Belford in the lower Hunter Valley, to the north of Sydney, and this is Pendarvis Estate here. The medical profession has been using wine as a medicine now for over 5,000 years, beginning with the ancient Egyptians. The ancients used the wine as an antiseptic because infection was one of the commonest causes of death. So they used it to clean out their wounds, sterilize their water, and to clean them before they were being operated on. They used it as a tranquilizer and as a sedative. They used it as a hypnotic to make them go to sleep. They used it as an anesthetic before operations. They used it as an anti-nauseant, an appetite stimulant, a tonic, a restorative during convalescence, as a treatment for anemia, as a diuretic, as a purgative, as a cooling agent, it was also the basis for most of their poultices and it was a mixing medium for all their medicines because they used the wine in which to blend their other medicines. One of the greatest civilizations of all time and one whose influence has continued down through the ages is that of the ancient Greeks. The ancient Greeks were great believers in the use of healthy nutrition and lifestyle to prevent and treat disease, and they used wine as one of their main medicines. The most famous physician of the ancient world was the Greek physician Hippocrates, who lived between 450 BC and 370 BC. He is the father of modern medicine because it was Hippocrates who was the first to say that diseases weren't caused by the wrath of the gods. He was trying to find an actual organic cause and not a religious or spiritual cause for the disease. Hippocrates was a great believer in the use of wine as a medicine and he was also a great believer in the use of it for cleaning wounds because as I said earlier sepsis from wounds was one of the commonest causes of death in the ancient world. Hippocrates also had the following to say about wine as a medicine. Wine is fit for man in a wonderful way provided that it is taken with good sense by the sick as well as the healthy. This is the amphitheatre at Epidavros, which was thought to be the most beautiful in the ancient world and is still used today. Epidavros was one of the leading centres of medical teaching in ancient Greece and was at its height during the 4th century BC.
Roman physicians were also great believers in the use of wine as a medicine. One of the most famous was Galen, who was a Greek who lived between 131 and 201 AD. He was a physician to the Roman emperor's gladiators, and one of the commonest injuries of gladiators was evisceration, where their abdominal cavity was opened up during their fighting and their bowel used to hang out. So he would soak the bowel in wine and then put the bowel back in and stitch them up and pray hard. Galen was also famous for his Galenicals, which were his medicines that he made up using herbs mixed in wine. And these medicines, or Galenicals, dominated medicine for the next 1,500 years. Paracelsus was a German physician who lived between 1493 and 1541. He is regarded as the father of modern pharmacology and is the doctor who gave us the word alcohol. And he is famous for saying that whether wine is a medicine, a nourishment or a poison is a matter of dosage, words that are still relevant today. Australia is unique in that so many of its vineyards were founded by doctors. In Europe, the vineyards were usually founded by either aristocratic families or religious orders. In fact, most of our liqueurs, such as Dom Benedictine, are ancient medicines made by those religious orders. In South Africa, the Boer farmers were the ones who founded most of the vineyards, and in the Americas, it was the Spanish missionaries who founded the vineyards. But in Australia, most of the early vineyards were founded by the medical profession. And the interesting question is, why is this so? The reason why so many doctors in Australia founded vineyards starts with the voyage of the Surrey, which was a convict ship that left England in 1814 with 200 male convicts on board. By the time the ship got to the east coast of Australia, 51 people on board that ship had died, including 36 convicts. Besides the convicts, the master of the ship, the first mate, second mate, third mate, coxswain, ship surgeon, six seamen and four soldiers had also died. This was a precarious situation as there was no one to navigate or sail the ship. Owing to this situation, Governor Macquarie ordered Sydney's leading physician, Dr William Redfern, to investigate. And what Redfern found out was that the master of the ship had held the convicts below and not allowed them onto the deck and had withheld their soap and wine ration. So that by the time the, the convicts got to the east coast of Australia, they were all suffering from jail fever, or louse-born typhus. So Dr Redfern made his famous 11-point recommendation to Governor Macquarie after he'd done his investigation, which were all written up later as instructions for surgeon superintendents on board convict ships bound for New South Wales and Van Diemen's Land and for the masters of those ships. Besides recommending proper food, clothing, shelter, airing of the bedding, washing out of the cells and allowing the convicts to go up on the top deck to get some fresh air, he also recommended that every convict be given a quarter of a pint of wine per day mixed with lime juice to prevent malnutrition and scurvy on the voyage out. And as he said, to dispel despondency from being kept below during bad weather and to restore the vigour of the system. So eventually, every convict ship coming out to Australia had a doctor on board who was conversant with the use of wine as a medicine, and every convict was given wine as a nourishment and a restorative and a prevention of malnutrition. So that is why it's unique to Australia, because last century Australia was the only country taking in large numbers of British convicts and therefore we had large numbers of doctors coming out to Australia who eventually settled here and founded their own vineyards to make wine as a medicine for their own patients. Before talking about 
some of Australia's more famous wine doctors, I want to talk about St Bartholomew's Hospital in London, which is the oldest hospital in the world, still on its original site, dating from 1123. Three of Australia's most famous wine doctors, Dr Lindemann, Dr Penfold and Dr Angove, all trained at St Bartholomew's Hospital. And one of its most famous doctors was Dr William Harvey, who in 1628 was the first person to describe the circulation of the blood around the body with the heart as a pump. So it's interesting the synergy of St Bartholomew's Hospital having Dr William Harvey describing circulation and Dr Lindemann and Dr Penfold and Dr Angove training there who later made wine which significantly reduces your heart attack risk and stroke risk and vascular disease risk in general. Dr Lindemann was the founder of the famous Lindemann Wine Company in Australia. He began it all in Kawara a property in the Hunter Valley in 1843 and he used wine as a therapeutic agent and was a great advocate of using wine to get people off rum which was rampant at the time in Australia creating havoc with its abuse and drunkenness. In 1871 he wrote a paper wine as a therapeutic agent and why it should become our national beverage where he was advocating the use of wine instead of rum as the standard drink in Australia. Dr Penfold founded Penfold's Wines in Australia and started it all in 1844 at McGill in the foothills of Adelaide in South Australia. He used wine as a treatment of his patient's anemia and as a tonic. Dr Kelly founded the Trinity Vineyard in 1845 in South Australia and then eventually the Tintara Vineyard which was taken over by Thomas Hardy and was the beginning of Hardy's Wines. So this is the third major wine company in Australia founded by a doctor. Dr William Angove founded Angove's Wines in Tea Tree Gully which is a suburb of Adelaide in South Australia in the late 1800s and he called his winery St Agnes after the patron saint of alcohol and beverages. This is Dr Angove in one of the first cars in South Australia. Dr Ferguson was Western Australia's first colonial surgeon and was famous as the first doctor in Australia to use a general anaesthetic. He also founded one of Western Australia's most famous vineyards called Hortons in the Swan Valley of Perth. Dr Thomas Fiasci was an Italian doctor who was quite a character. He finished his training at St Vincent's Hospital and founded two vineyards, one called Tizana near Windsor in the outskirts of Western Sydney and the other one called St Augustine in the Mudgee region of New South Wales. He was a famous surgeon at Sydney Hospital and was a great believer in the use of wine as a medicine. In fact, in 1906, he gave a lecture to the members of the Australasian Trained Nurses Association called The Various Wines Used in Sickness and in Convalescence. And in this lecture, he described how all diseases could be treated with the appropriate wine. At the beginning of the lecture, he stated the following. To avoid misunderstandings, I tell you frankly that I consider the temperate use of wine a valuable support to healthy man in this thorny path of life, and that the judicious use of it has proved itself to me of incalculable benefit in the treatment of the sick and the convalescent. In the 1800s, the two commonest causes of insanity were tertiary syphilis because there was no penicillin and pollution of the brain from adulterated spirits usually from heavy metal poisoning. Australia is unique in that it had vineyards in four of its leading lunatic asylums or psychiatric hospitals. The first one was at Gladesville Psychiatric Hospital in Sydney 
It was run by Dr. Frederick Norton Manning, who used the wine as a tonic and as a medicine in general. But it was mainly to prevent malnutrition and scurvy with his patients. Dr. Beatty Smith was a very famous psychiatrist in Melbourne and he established a vineyard at the very large Ararat Asylum in Victoria. And Dr. Watkins founded a vineyard at the Sunbury Lunatic Asylum, also in Victoria. The Lunatic Asylum in Adelaide was run by Dr. William Lennox Cleland, who used the vineyard as a means of therapy for his patients because they tended the vines. He also established a silkworm industry with mulberry trees, and he also established an olive oil industry when he planted olive trees also for his patients to tend. Surgeon Major General Hinton St George, late of the Bengal Army, settled in South Australia and bought some land at Coonawarra and planted his St George vineyard. Lindemans now own that vineyard and therefore a bottle of Lindemann's St George wine is quite probably the only bottle of wine in the world with two doctors' names on the label. Therefore, it's twice as good for you. Another famous vineyard in Australia is called Minchinbury in the outskirts of Western Sydney and was founded by Dr. Mackay late in the 1800s. This is what everybody wants to avoid, arriving in a large public hospital in an ambulance after suffering a heart attack or a stroke. So how can we prevent this? This is a picture of a normal coronary artery showing how clear it should normally be with no obstruction to the blood flow. This is the picture of a coronary artery with atheromatous plaque formation which would start to restrict the blood flow to the heart. This final picture is of a coronary artery with a large atheromatous plaque blocking off the blood flow to the heart with the final obstruction occurring with a clot forming to block off completely the blood flow. This person would have suffered a major heart attack. The following animation describes how the different types of cholesterol can block off or clear away the atheroma in your arteries. Everyone needs a certain amount of cholesterol in their body because it plays an important role in the production of hormones and cell membranes. However, cholesterol in excess of what our bodies need may build up on artery walls, eventually blocking an artery and causing a heart attack. This is the type of cholesterol that we commonly think about and is called LDL cholesterol. This should be thought of as bad cholesterol. Not all cholesterol is bad, however. A type of cholesterol known as HDL can take bad cholesterol from the artery wall to the liver for excretion. This should be thought of as good cholesterol. The higher the level of HDL, the better. Another type of fat is known as triglyceride. This is a valuable source of energy. However, an excess can cause the level of good cholesterol to decrease, allowing the bad cholesterol to return to do more damage. For this reason, we call triglyceride the ugly. Therefore, when thinking of cholesterol, we should think of the good, the bad and the ugly. Wine in moderation can reduce vascular deaths by up to 50%. Firstly, it raises your good cholesterol, which clears away the atheroma. Secondly, it reduces your bad cholesterol, which forms the atheroma. Thirdly, it acts as an antioxidant. The bad cholesterol has to be oxidised before it can be incorporated in the artery wall. So if wine acts as an antioxidant, it prevents this from happening. Lastly, wine acts as an anticoagulant. In other words, it stops clots from forming or thins the blood. It does this by three different mechanisms. It reduces platelet aggregation and platelets are the special clotting cells in the blood. 
It reduces fibrin formation, fibrin being the substance in the blood that binds the platelets together to form the clot. And it increases fibrin elysis, which is the mechanism that breaks down clots. So when you add all four mechanisms together, wine can reduce your vascular disease significantly. The next section of this documentary will talk about stroke, which is one of the commonest manifestations of a blocked artery in the body, the other one being having a heart attack. During this section, Professor Lusby, the Professor of Vascular Surgery at Sydney University, will talk about the operation that prevents stroke called endarterectomy, where you remove away the plaque that blocks off the carotid arteries flowing to the brain. Stroke can hit someone as young as 45, but in many cases it can be prevented with surgery called carotid endarterectomy. Strokes occur when the brain is deprived of oxygen-rich blood. The operation clears away fatty deposits from the arteries carrying blood to the brain. Two groups in the population are at risk of stroke. Those who are having mini strokes, forewarnings, where they might have loss of use of an arm or blindness in an eye, no doubt that that group of people will benefit from surgery. But the other group, which is about 95% of the population, don't have forewarnings, but may have narrowing in the artery. A simple procedure using ultrasound can identify those people at risk. Important tool now to help us try and find those patients who are at risk of having a stroke, even though they don't have any forewarning. Now it's also possible not only to see the plaque, but also to look at the blood flow and listen to it. Here, Professor Lusby scrubs up before the operation. Now he will disinfect and drape the patient prior to starting the surgery. Right. Now we make the incision two finger rest below the angle of the jaw and more or less in the uh, skin crease. Carotid endarterectomy, or cleaning the blockage from the blood vessel, is now the commonest vascular operation in the United States, about 100,000 a year. It's a delicate procedure because there are lots of important things around the carotid which wouldn't be nice for the surgeon to damage. And right behind here is the vagus nerve which carries in at the fibres that go to the voice box and if we damage that, the patient will have a hoarse voice among other unwanted complications. But the real worry is about dislodging some of the debris in the artery and actually causing a stroke. And the arteries in, what's that, Jeff? They obviously have to clamp the artery before they remove the obstruction and to ensure that enough blood gets to the brain from the other side while the squeeze is on. The surgeons have to check the back pressure's okay. Stump pressures are quite adequate, I mean, they're very high. And we'll keep his blood pressure at that level, though, throughout the endarterectomy and uh, uh, the dissector press. And this is the obstructing plaque, which we can see just there, all that area there. Okay. Coming on. Mm -hmm. Professor Lusby works around a lump of atherosclerosis and it shows out really quite easily. Here's the ulcerated area here, which is causing his symptoms. Let's just clear that, and out it comes. Just bring that down a little bit, like that. One can see that the actual vessel wall is broken down, and there are two holes in it, and it's the material in these holes, this sort of material here, that, that can go up to the brain, up this artery here. Is that also where the blood clots form? Exactly. Mm -hmm. The blood clots form in this area here and can be dislodged and go up as well. So the two basic mechanisms, blood clots forming and going up, and the actual breakdown of the material in the vessel wall, this sort of loose material here, that can fly up to the brain and block the smaller arteries in the brain, causing a stroke. And really, it's the removal of this type of pathology that makes this operation a success. Aspirin doesn't influence this sort of pathology. 
I'm now talking to Professor Bob Lusby, who's the Professor of Vascular Surgery at Sydney University. And like many Australian doctors, he set up his own vineyard called Tintilla. But he's gone one step further and actually established an olive grove as well. We'll ask Professor Lusby what he thinks about the role of wine, olive oil and the Mediterranean diet to prevent vascular disease from a vascular surgeon's perspective or point of view. So I think the, uh, the most important thing is the patient comes to you after an operation and says, what can I do now to prevent having further trouble? We've scraped out the plaque, we've reanastomosed the vessel. They don't want to come back and have another operation and they want to know what they can do to prevent it. There's a lot of evidence that the Mediterranean diet is probably the best thing that they can do in terms of reducing the risk of plaque formation. The antioxidant effect of the wine and of the olives is very important in lowering the LDL cholesterol, the key cholesterol that can get into the arteries and build up plaques. So I tell them to sit back and think about having a modified diet, a couple of glasses of red wine, drinking in moderation. Some of them like white wine, I think that's all right too, but the red wine is probably a little bit better. A bit of fish in their diet, and olive oil because it really is the best olive oil in terms of its antioxidant uh, benefit. It's, it's really interesting to see how people are keen to do something to improve their overall outcome. And the other important thing, of course, is exercise. Getting them up and walking, encouraging them to walk morning and evening, and they're well motivated. If you've had an operation to remove a plaque, you're keen to prevent it happening again. So there's no doubt the evidence, the Copenhagen study showing how there was a significant reduction in uh, mortality from stroke and cardiac disease, 50% reduction from just taking two glasses of wine, wine in moderation. Uh, no doubt about it that the Mediterranean diet and wine in moderation are part of a healthy lifestyle and the way forward for people who have had proven vascular disease. So there you have it from a vascular surgeon's point of view, how to prevent blocking off your arteries. Next we'll get the view of two cardiologists. First we'll talk to Professor Serge Renault of Bordeaux University in France who is famous for his French paradox research. Then we'll talk to one of Sydney's leading preventative cardiologists, Dr Ross Walker, who tries to get people to prevent having a heart attack by changes in lifestyle. The French paradox is the observation that uh, the French, despite the fact that they eat a lot of saturated fat, such as, for example, uh, goose fat, you see, and, and foie gras, and all kinds of fatty things, and despite the fact they have a high cholesterol and high blood pressure, they don't have the mortality rate from coronary heart disease or cardiovascular disease as well, like many other countries that they have the same level of smoking, same, uh, even lower level of hypertension. So this suggests that there is a factor that uh, protects the French. And uh, it seems that uh, part at least of this factor is the, the, the French habit of drinking wine. You have to consider that uh, the French are the largest uh, wine drinkers in the in the world, the greatest life drink uh, wine drinkers in the world, and uh, if wine protects from coronary heart disease, as it has been shown, while well, it's normal, they are protected. We will now hear from Dr. Ross Walker, who is a heart specialist in Sydney. Dr. Walker will give us his views about wine and health from a preventative cardiologist point of view. I think wine is an important part of the whole spectrum of diet when we're talking about preventative cardiology. The, to me it's not just about drinking wine, it's about drinking wine and having that wine with a proper meal. If you look at the, the best dietary habits in the world, I believe they come from the Mediterranean area, and we look at the benefits of the Mediterranean diet. Now one of the aspects of Mediterranean eating is that they eat their main meal during uh, the lunch period rather than having their main meal at night. And with that, they'll sit around for an hour or so, have a couple of glasses of red wine, and enjoy a meal that's based around pastas, vegetables, fruits, nuts, and legumes. I believe this is really the best way we should be eating. 
Now, where does wine come into that? Firstly, the thing about drinking wine is it should be sipped very slowly and it should be enjoyed slowly with food. There are, I believe there are five benefits of, of consuming red wine as far as the cardiovascular system goes. Number one, in the skin of the red grape, there is a substance known as resveratrol. Resveratrol acts to drop LDL cholesterol, plus has many other actions in stabilising the lining of blood vessels and also keeping the blood a bit thin. Number two, all alcohol, whether it be wine, spirits or beer, increases the HDL cholesterol. HDL cholesterol is, of course, the, the cholesterol that protects against heart disease. It acts almost like Drano sucking out all the fat out of, out of the blood, blood vessels. Number three, and I think most importantly, red wine has the three strongest dietary antioxidants known to man, and these antioxidants prevent the bad cholesterol being oxidised and therefore laying down fat in the blood vessel system. Number four, red wine has natural salicylates and other blood thinners that keeps the blood nice and thin, very similar to what aspirin does. And number five, and I think most importantly, is the anxiety relieving effects of a couple of glasses of red. There is nothing better than at the end of an evening, uh, end of a busy day, coming home and uh, knocking off the top of a bottle of red wine and sitting down sipping it slowly with your family and, and enjoying that and, all, and, and achieving that anxiety relief that a lot of people get from other mechanisms which I don't think are as good for you. So there we have the view of a preventative cardiologist talking about preventing and treating two of society's biggest diseases, the vascular diseases and the stress-related diseases. Wine in moderation also is a fat and cholesterol-free source of carbohydrate. It's good as a tonic because it's a good source of vitamins, minerals and trace elements. Because of the improved blood flow to the bones, it can reduce osteoporosis. Because of the improved blood flow to the brain, it can reduce dementia. It can also thin clots in the legs and therefore reduce deep vein thrombosis or DVT. And with improved blood flow to the back of the eye, it can reduce macular degeneration. The four commonest causes of blindness in our advanced society is due to blood pressure, glaucoma, diabetes or macular degeneration. The first three can be treated but macular degeneration can't so it's best to be prevented. This first slide shows a picture of a normal retina showing the optic disc with the nerve arteries and veins and the pointer pointing to the macula where we focus. The second slide shows a degenerated or dying off macula. Wine in moderation is also shown to be an anti-carcinogen or to fight cancer. It can increase your morale and appetite, which is important if you're convalescing in a hospital. It can reduce gallstones. In moderation, can reduce blood pressure, can reduce colds, can reduce Helicobacter pylori, which is the bacteria that can cause stomach ulcers. And diabetics can drink dry wines because all the sugar is being converted to alcohol but only in moderation. In this section of the video, we'll talk about the three commonest questions people ask me about wine and health. What is moderation? Why do women only get half the amount as men? And which is the best form of wine, red wine or white wine? Firstly, what is moderation? I go by the Australian National Health and Medical Research Council's recommendation of a maximum of four standard drinks a day for a male and a maximum of two standard drinks a day for a female, where a standard drink is equivalent to 10 grams of alcohol or 120 to 150 mils of wine, depending upon the percentage alcohol, because all wines vary in their percentage alcohol content. Why do women only get half the amount of alcohol as men? Well, it gets down to a word called alcohol dehydrogenase, which is the name of the enzyme that metabolizes or breaks down alcohol. It usually does it in the liver, and there's also a small amount of it doing it in your stomach. Now, when Mother Nature was giving out alcohol dehydrogenase, for some reason, men got twice the amount as women. But there are other reasons why women can only have half the amount of alcohol as men. Women are usually smaller framed than men, and also have less fluid in their body, and therefore can dissolve less alcohol. And also, women have relatively more fat to muscle than men, and alcohol is what we call lipophobic doesn't like fat and therefore prefers to be dissolved in muscle and because men have got more muscle therefore they can have more alcohol. Which wine is better for you, red wine or white wine? If you go by Professor Serge Renault of the French Paradox fame, 
red wine is better for you. But there's some new research that's just come out showing that white wine is just as effective as red wine in preventing vascular disease. So as far as I'm concerned, you should go by what are you eating? Because wine should complement and marry food. And therefore, if you're going to have a well-balanced meal, you usually will have some white wine with your entree or fish and some red wine with your main course or meats. And therefore, you've had a bit of each and you've got all your bases covered. So as far as I'm concerned, wine complements food and therefore you should be determined by what you're eating and not determined by whether it's red or white. What is a standard drink? A standard drink in most countries is the equivalent of 10 grams of alcohol, which is equal to a nip or 30 mils of spirits, 60 mils of fortified wine, 120 to 150 mils of wine, depending upon its percentage alcohol, a midi of full strength beer, or a schooner of light beer. They're all the same, 10 grams of alcohol. Some countries have different values, such as England, which has eight grams of alcohol as a standard drink, and America, which has 12 grams of alcohol as a standard drink. But there's definitely a need for a standard, standard drink, so that when we talk about research and how many standard drinks people can drink, or how many standard drinks are in a bottle, we're all talking about the same thing. And as far as I'm concerned, that should be 10 grams of alcohol because it's in the middle of the normal range. Most countries have adopted it, and it's also decimal, so it's easy to work out the percentages, etc., because it's all in decimal instead of 8 grams or 12 grams. Whilst talking about standard drinks, we should also point out that if you abuse alcohol, in other words, have more than your daily allowance of standard drinks, you can suffer all the bad consequences of alcohol abuse, such as stomach ulcers, cirrhosis of the liver, pancreatitis, damaging of the brain, damaging of the peripheral nerves, etc. Always stick to your moderation. Do not abuse alcohol. Alcohol abuse comes in two types, those who abuse it on a daily basis, or more commonly, those who are binge drinkers. In other words, those who abuse it at the weekend. These are the harder people to convince they've got an alcohol problem because they say that they don't need to have alcohol during the week, but they only want it at the weekend. Therefore, because they can abstain from having alcohol during the week, they don't consider themselves as alcoholics. But the fact that they abuse the alcohol at the weekend, each weekend, in a binge fashion, does mean that they are alcoholics. Remember, let's put things in proper perspective. 40 to 50 percent of all our deaths are due to vascular disease, and we have shown that half of those could be prevented by drinking in moderation, whereas 3 to 5 percent of all deaths are due to alcohol abuse. More people die from not drinking than from abusing alcohol. Therefore, there is a net health benefit from drinking in moderation. Lastly, we'll get the overview about wine and health from a general physician, Professor James Lawrence, who's also the Professor of Medicine from Sydney University, Australia's oldest university. I think things have changed enormously in the last 10 years. What we've now realised, and the data have come in, are that those people who drink wine in appropriate moderation do better than those people who don't. This applies to men and to women. Men can have a little more than women, but the data now are quite clearly in, in a variety of studies, that survival and longevity is greater in those people who do drink wine in moderation. Uh, I'm delighted, of course, because this brings so many social and personal advantages and drinking of wine sensibly is an extraordinarily pleasurable thing to do. The precise reasons for this we now have excellent rationalizations for and good biochemical and physiological reasons why it probably works, but we still haven't proven the final link in the chain, if you like, but the research that's going on makes it more and more likely that we're going to have clear evidence as to why it works. I prefer to think, however, that it's the drinking of wine in the whole social structure as well as whatever 
chemical and physiological effect it has that leads to its enormous advantages. And overall, I think we can give it a tick. Thank you very much, Professor Lawrence. Thank you. Now that our journey is coming to an end, you've seen that wine is our oldest medicine and if taken in moderation, has a lot of medical benefits. So much so that I refer to wine as the thinking person's health drink. The answer to alcohol abuse is not prohibition. That was tried in the past in America, for example, and failed miserably. The answer to alcohol abuse is education and identifying those who are at risk because alcoholism does have a genetic characteristic. In other words, it can run in families. Teaching people to drink the right forms of alcohol, which is bottled wine or low alcohol beer, is what it's all about. If we can get people to drink the right forms of alcohol in the right amount, which is in moderation, you get all the health benefits plus quality as well as quantity of life. So you get to have your cake and eat it too. Which brings me to what I call the art of sensible drinking. Today, it is possible for people to monitor their own important body parameters, such as their blood pressure or their blood sugar. So people with high blood pressure can have their own sphygmomanometer and take their own blood pressure, and people who are diabetic can have their own glucose testing equipment and measure their own blood sugar at home. It is also possible to measure your own blood alcohol level accurately. Australia is the first country in the world to have a standard for handheld blood alcohol measuring equipment. And the only one to pass this strict standard is the alkalizer unit. So now you can measure your alcohol level instead of the police random breath testing equipment which measures it to 0.05, you can now measure to 0.005 and therefore know accurately what your blood alcohol level is so that you don't operate machinery or drive while under the influence of alcohol. So remember, wine is still our oldest and best medicine if consumed in moderation. Nobody has been able to improve on it over the centuries. Unless there is a contraindication, consuming wine in moderation is the best preventative health measure you can do except giving up smoking. And remember, as Louis Pasteur said, wine is the most healthful and hygienic of beverages. So enjoy it in moderation. Cheers.